ahead and start the webinar. Uh, thank you everyone for being here today. We're very excited to have this webinar. Uh, we're gonna be talking about how to deal with ageism in your job search, uh, which is an, obviously a topic that a lot of people care about and we hear a lot about from um, people who are on flex jobs or just job seekers that we interact with. Uh, so we're really excited to have today's guest expert, Mark Miller here. I'm just gonna go over a couple housekeeping items before we actually get started. The first is that this is about a 60 minute webinar, so we'll try to keep it to that 60 minutes. We'll be ending at the top of the next hour, so it's 1 p.m. Central Time. Uh, and the, there will be a Q&A for at least the last 15 to 20 minutes where we'll open this up to audience questions. So as uh, Mark and I are having our conversation and we're going over some of the main themes of his tips and advice for dealing with ageism in your job search, if more questions are coming up for you, um, please feel free to put them in the questions area of your GoToWebinar control panel. You can type them in there and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can in that last part of the, the webinar. Uh, we will only be able to answer questions that are, are not very specific. So if you have a very specific story that you're hoping to get some specific advice on, we probably won't be able to get to those questions, but we will try to ask as many questions as we think would be helpful for most of the group to hear about. So keep that in mind when you're um, entering your questions in there. And this webinar will be recorded, so no need to furiously be scribbling notes. Um, you can also listen to it again. We'll be sending out a link tomorrow in our follow-up email, so you'll be able to view the recording. And we also have a handout that you can download. Uh, that is on the GoToWebinar control panel as well, where you're uh, entering your questions if you have any. There's a handout section, so you can download the handout from there. Uh, if the handout for some reason doesn't download for you, with some people have issues downloading this handout um, from GoToWebinar, we do have a link that you can follow to get the handout. So uh, if that is an issue, you can follow that link that we're putting there in the chat box um, to get the webinar. We'll have that all ready for you guys in just a few minutes um, so that you can download the handout that way. So if you do have any problems, just let us know. We also have someone on the, on the line standing by to answer questions um, in the background as they come in for things like that. Um, so thank you, Jen Blaze from FlexJobs for doing that. Um, <laughs> so actually, I didn't introduce myself before. I'm Bree Reynolds. I'm the Senior Career Specialist at FlexJobs and very excited to be hosting today's webinar. Um, today, we're going to be talking about FlexJobs and Mark Miller, just briefly, so you know who is actually talking to if you're not familiar with either either one of these, uh, these groups. Um, and then we'll be figuring out where to focus first with ageism. Um, where should you be putting you know, your, your biggest efforts? Uh, we'll talk about health, dress, and skills, job application tips, job interview and networking tips, and personal branding 101. So just a little bit about FlexJobs, and then I'll tell you a little bit about Mark, and then we'll go ahead and get started. Um, for anybody who's not familiar, FlexJobs was founded almost 10 years ago. We're about to celebrate our 10th anniversary in January. And we're a job search website that lists pre-screened, telecommuting, flexible schedule, full-time and part-time, and freelance jobs. So essentially anything that's outside of that traditional in-office nine to five model is what we focus on at FlexJobs. We have over 60 staffers who all work from home, so we kind of walk the walk when it comes to flexible work options. A lot of us also have flexible schedules and we've been doing this for years, so we really understand this kind of work and where to find it. And uh, we love helping people find the same types of work for themselves. And um, speaking of which, since that founding in 2007, we've helped over 2 million job seekers in their searches for flexible jobs. Uh, one of the big things we have on our site is a database of over 40,000 researched and vetted companies, which means companies that we have pre-screened to make sure that they're legitimate and that they've offered professional level flexible jobs. So some a job with some type of flexibility or any combination of those types of flexibility that I mentioned before. Uh, so that's a great resource that anybody can take advantage of, whether or not you're a FlexJobs member. You can go to FlexJobs.com and go to Research Companies and see if you can find any companies in your area or your career field that support flexibility. And we're also a membership site at FlexJobs. So instead of um, uh, posting jobs and taking money from employers for job postings, we are a membership site that where job seekers subscribe and you can subscribe for one month, three months or one year and you get access to all of our listings. We have a lot of skills testing and special um, features and help for job seekers looking for flexible work in particular. And we also guarantee that all of the jobs on our site are scam-free, ad-free, uh, no commission-only jobs. 
it's really just a clean database of flexible job listings. So if you're in the market for flexible jobs, it's a really great resource. We also offer a 100% satisfaction guarantee. So if for any reason you use FlexJobs and you decide, meh, this really wasn't for me, we don't ask questions. All you have to do is ask for a refund and that will be processed. We just try to make it easy and try to provide a worthwhile service for everybody. Um, and I'll be happy to answer questions about that if you guys have any also. But let's get on to the bulk of the presentation today. So I'm very excited to introduce our expert guest, Mark Miller of CareerPivot.com. And FlexJobs and CareerPivot have had a really nice partnership for the last few years at least, and I've been very happy to work with Mark over that time. Um, this is not Mark's first webinar with FlexJobs, so you can definitely search our blog to find all of his different webinar appearances, his guest blogs. Uh, he's just provided some really solid information for FlexJobs uh, viewers and readers over the years, so happy to have Mark here. Um, Mark served 22 years at IBM. He's also been involved in several tech startups. He was a high school teacher. He was involved in nonprofit fundraising. And then as he might tell us a little bit about, he had a near fatal bicycle accident that sort of changed his perspective forever. And he founded Career Pivot, which is called a career design firm, which I love that description um, for people in their second half of life. Uh, so of course, people dealing with ageism in the job search. And what Mark does is he helps professionals move towards new careers through small and practical steps, which is exactly the type of information that I like to get when I'm looking for tips and advice. So Mark, thank you very much for joining us today. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I, I did my first webinar in 1997. So I've been doing webinars for a little while. So you're on your 20th anniversary almost. Yes, <laughs> Happy anniversary. yes that's right. And yes, they had webinars back then. <laughs> well, not bad. We're glad to have you. Um, so, Mark, the first question is, is uh, actually, no, I'm sorry. I forgot about our poll. We want to do a quick poll just to find out about what the audience is like here. So I'm going to run this poll. A poll is going to launch on your screen, and you'll be able to participate. So we want to know what your current employment status is, just to kind of get a sense of where people are coming from, uh, you know, what, basically, you know, what what experience you're having right now as far as job searching. So we'll give you another minute or so to fill that out. And as you guys are clicking your answers, I can see the uh, the poll numbers shifting back and forth here a little bit, and we'll see what comes out on top. Just as soon as things are steady for a minute, I'll give everyone a chance to weigh in. Looks like we have about 85% of people who voted. That's great. And it looks like we are slowing down just a little bit here. So I'm going to go ahead and end the poll. Thank you all very much for, uh, for participating in this poll. We got about 90% participation overall. And I understand some people are probably listening to this in your car or <laughs> doing something else where you can't actually click on the, uh, the information. So here are the results um, for current status. So as you can see, the vast majority of people on the call today, 53% are unemployed. And then another 15% are re-entering the workforce, followed by employed but looking to change careers, and then employed but looking to change jobs. And then 5% are retired. So a pretty good mix overall of different places that people are coming from. And we'll kind of try to provide some information that will help everybody you know, in your in each of your own situations. So thanks for doing that. Um, so first, I'm going to ask Mark a series of questions about um, his experience with ageism, but also what tips and advice he has for the group. And then, as I said, when we're done with these questions, we will get into audience questions. Um, so Mark, tell us a little bit about your own experiences with ageism. Yeah, it's uh, it's funny. Ageism shows up in both. Uh, subtle ways and very explicit ways. And let me give you two stories. First one was at my second tech startup. Uh, I was in my near the end. Um, my I had an unethical boss, so I, I was gonna I was planning on quitting anyway. And I was getting ready to hire a technical trainer. And halfway through the process, I was uh, a Another individual was inserted between me and my boss. And as I was trying to hire this nice gentleman, who I will call Tom, Tom was about the same age as I was, in his mid-50s, a very experienced technical trainer. I had him come, come in and actually present to us. And afterwards, my new, the guy who had been inserted, said, you know what, 
I don't really want to hire him. He just doesn't seem to have the energy. Well, those kind of comments, that is strictly, <laughs> it's blatant ageism. Um, anytime someone says, well, they don't have the energy, it means they're too old. And it's not blatant, but it's, uh, it's pretty obvious. The other example I want to give where it was real obvious. I had a client who was in his late 60s. Uh, I'll call him Andy. Uh, Andy um, was an expert in his field. And he had, during the Great Recession, had been spit out by one of the major consulting, one of the big consulting houses. And uh, an opportunity came up at a major um, fast food chain to start an innovation lab. And he went in for the interview. It was going to be a panel interview. And he walked in. And Andy was quite fit, but he was in his late 60s. <clears throat> and he kind of looked it in his face, but he was, he was small and fit. And um, as soon as he walked in the door, he said, uh, you could see the, the faces, the, on the, their expressions changed. One of the persons, supposed to be an hour interview, one of the persons left after 15 minutes, and they were done in 35 minutes. In other words, he walked in, they realized how old he was, and that was it. So take a guess. Um, that, that is a blatant example of ageism. Yeah, those are, those are two pretty good examples. And in your line of work, you probably see lots of people who are unfortunately dealing with this. Yeah, yeah. Well, w one of the things you want to make sure is uh, you kind of discover this early on. And it's, if, put it bluntly, if everybody in the place is 25 years old, the odds are if you're in your 50s and 60s, the odds of getting hired are probably pretty small. And so I like to say you're always looking for companies that hire people who look, taste, and smell like you. Yep, that, that about sums it up. Right, right. right. I mean, I've, I've got a client right now <clears throat> who's 55. She's remaking herself as a Ruby on Rails programmer. And so one of the things I've got her doing is getting on LinkedIn, searching the location where she lives for Ru people with Ruby on Rails in their profile. And, and she, of course, she does the search. She comes up with, you know, 1,000 people, 95% of them are young guys. But she does find some older folks who look, taste, and smell like her, and the and and she she started looking around and where do these people work? In her case, it's mostly in federal and state agencies. So that's where we're pursuing. Oh, that yeah, sense. that does right? make sense. Yeah, right. right. They hire. They're fair hiring places. Why do I want to start pursuing places that you know what I may not fit in? As a fifty-five, as a fifty-five-year-old woman, she could be most of these kids' mothers. So, those those are my examples of of, of ageism. So, where should we focus? Where should people focus first to fight against ageism? Uh, in fact, I was just listening to a real good webinar on called Money Matters. And the two pieces are vitality and subject matter, matter experts, your skills. The, the more you, as I said, that one opportunity with Tom, who he, he was in his mid-50s. He was somewhat fit. He was probably a bit overweight. Uh, but it, if you look like you're going to be able to keep up, you have the vitality to keep up. No one's going to question you about that. The second piece is you got to make sure and not just tell people you know what you you know your stuff. You need to show people you know your stuff. As we reach further in our career, we really have to be at the top of our game. On social media, it's publishing things. 
Uh, and by the way, it's never been easier to be able to demonstrate your expertise. I mean, I use the class example. I've published two books. I'm working on a third one. They're all self-published. The cost to me has been very, very small. Yes, you can do that. Um, you know, publishing things on on different uh, blogs, f guest posting. Um, I have the one example. Uh, I had one one guy who followed me very diligently, who wanted to trade in change industries. And one of the things he did was he has a blog called the um, uh, Technical Product Management Blog. And for 18 months, he interviewed people in the industry he wanted to get into, and wrote about. Them. Oh, isn't that smart? And can you hear me again, Mark? I'm sorry. Yes, about I, can, that. I can. I can hear you. Uh, <laughs> sorry, and, everyone. And and so yes, it's a, it is a matter of well, it's somewhere. I was on a a a, a, a podcast last night, um, and I was talking about how not to be a turkey in your job search, uh, and it was for it was the E S six methods, and it's uh, IT professionals and project managers and that kind of like. And the gentleman who's doing it, he's building up his brand uh, by by doing it, and it's it's demonstrating his expertise, uh, even though it may not. He's interviewing people by interviewing people uh, with expert expertise. He is demonstrating his own expertise. He's establishing his brand. So, I really want you to think about vitality, i.e., your health. And two, your job skills and how do you demonstrate it? How do people know you know your stuff? So mm -hmm. yeah, and it's true. It's very true. Demonstrating your experience in that way and yeah, gaining contacts at the same time. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's um, yes, you have to um, do something that most of us. You know, I'm, I'm over sixty now. Is um, go out and uh, brag. Yeah, I, I need to brag, uh, which, put, put it bluntly, most of us grew up in the 60s, 50s, 60s, 70s, were told, don't do that. You can't brag about yourself. Well, actually, you need to do that. And and that's and, and that's the easiest way to, people will not pay attention to your age if, if you are, uh, uh, if you're an expert in your field. And they know, and they know you beforehand. Yep, good points. Okay. Um, so the the next kind of uh, topics that has to do with the the health, dress, and skills area that you cover a lot is as far as areas that people really need to focus when they're fighting ageism. So talk to us a little bit about how people can assess their weak spots in those areas: health, dress, and skills. Well, number one, your health. We all know there was every year the Fidelity comes out with a report on. What a, what is going to cost a married couple 65? Just how much are they going to spend in the rest of their life on health care? And today it's something like two hundred sixty thousand dollars, and that's out of pocket expenses. So both from your future and uh, and for your career, uh, get healthy, lose weight. Um, it's rather interesting. When I came out of my last last startup, uh, I have I found various pictures. I, I belong to a major breakfast club here in town, in Austin, Texas, and um, I found pictures of me with some of the speakers in my last year on the job. And boy, I looked old. I was worn out. Um, so number one, yes, you need to focus on your health and get healthy. If if you don't look like you can keep up, the, the assumption is you will not be able to keep up. And remember, people will make assumptions about you. And that is their, their uh, perceptions are their reality. The other piece is really focus on dress. And this is both, um, both dressing up and dressing down. So in my career, I have used dress in both directions. Uh, back in the 1990s, when I worked for IBM, I had um, uh, I, I, IBM. We signed this huge contract with Group Bull, 
and French computer manufacturer, and I had 90 French, German, and Italians on my doorstep three days after Francois Mitterrand signed the contract. And for the next three months, I wore a suit every single day. And by the way, I hardly wore a suit my entire career at IBM. And it was because they knew I was in charge. Now, on the other side, when I went to work for my first tech startup in 2000, it was a semiconductor startup, I was very dependent on my young engineers and my young field application engineers. I came to work every day in t-shirt and shorts and flip-flops. They would treat me like I was one of them. Yet I was a I was a manager and I was a, a a manager and I was a peer to their boss. They didn't treat me that way because of the way I dressed. Now, rather interesting. I hear recently this last year I had a client who had been a uh, chief of staff for a Fortune 500 CEO for a number of years, and and through a bunch of mishaps, she ends up getting laid off. And she went in to interview with a um, hedge fund uh, executive and for a chief of staff position. And she didn't ask anything about who she was interviewing with, what the standard dress code was. So, and my client, she was, uh, she's, was 59, 60 years old. She came in in a really, really good looking suit. While she walks in the office, the hedge fund manager was a 35-year-old woman with, with jeans that hold, had holes in them. Say the least, she didn't get hired. So one of the things that you have to be comfortable with is understanding, do you dress up? Do you dress down? You have to know where to dress and do not assume that I'm going to walk in in a suit and tie or a dress suit or, you know, how I would have done things 15 years ago. You need to dress appropriately for the environment. I always like saying you want to find out what the dress code is and dress just a tad above it. And it's so interesting that you say that because I remember even 10 or 15 years ago that traditional career advice wisdom was just what you said, to always wear a suit. If you're going to a job interview, if you're meeting with a networking contact, just always, you know, you can't go wrong with a suit. And now it's really more about playing that part, like you said, uh, you know, dress at their, that level just a little bit above it. <laughs> um, it's a very yeah. different way of approaching the job search now than it was not that long ago. Yeah, I, you know, if my client had gone in with a nice pair of jeans, a nice nice blouse, um, you know, maybe a jacket, she probably would have been all right. But coming in that suit, uh, that, and, and, and the fact that, you know, and, and the office was a bunch of hedge fund managers, and they were all in their 30s. Say the least, she was old enough to be their mom. And, and, and so this is no different than, uh, well, I want you to think about when you were in your 20s and 30s, would you consider working with your grandpa or grandma? You don't, want to be, you don't want to put yourself in that position. Now, put it bluntly, most of us are in much better shape physically and mentally than our parents were at the same age. We need to demonstrate that. And the last piece here is your skills. Your skills have to be up to date. This is absolutely critical. Things are changing too fast. I've done a number of blog posts on have your, has your job been smacked? And smack stands for social, mobile, analytics, or cloud. If you think your job is not going to be touched by one of those, um, no, maybe you should be built like Bill Clinton and maybe you shouldn't hail. <laughs> uh, you know, it's just, it, you will be touched by it. And it, by the way, it's, it's touching people even more um, than you would ever thought. Um, I know there's a gentleman on this webinar right now, he said he was going to be on, who I've been working with, who um, used to be a Microsoft certified engineer. 
worked with a lot of small companies putting in Outlook servers and and very exchange servers and all that good stuff. Well, Microsoft with Microsoft Office 365, they have uh, they moved everything to the cloud. Your job is not safe. So therefore, you really have to focus on where your skills are today and where do they need to be in the next two and three years. Now, this includes, you know, whether you're in marketing, um, you know, public relations, even te technology fields. Um, if you look at what analytics are doing um, to, you know, uh, it's rather interesting. I have put, you know, ads on my website. And when I first did that, I got on with Google AdSense, and I put the AdSense plugin in, and I asked around. I sent an email to about 30 people around the world what ads were showing up. Well, Google was displaying different ads for everyone, and it was based on what they knew about you. So th that world is changing rapidly. So you have to really go assess your skills. And this is getting out and both looking at people like yourself um, and saying, okay, what skills are other people acquiring? And, and all of this is about going off and self-assessing yourself. How do you compare? And, um, and, and it's, I, I use the analogy, don't be a turkey. Um, Turkeys are, uh, they are they, today they are born in sterile environments. The butcher takes care of them really well for three years. Every day is better than the last until the fourth Thursday in November on the third year. When well, ain't so good to be a turkey? So all of these things you need to address, and you need to keep up on them. So, Bree, Indeed. Okay, <laughs> I have found a lot of people like the uh, the turkey analogy. Um, yeah, and uh, and this time of year, especially, it's one that'll stick with us. I think. <laughs> Everyone well, might be I, thinking about this webinar in another couple of weeks. <laughs> well, I'll use the example. I worked for IBM in 1992. I was a turkey, good because in January of 1993, IBM nearly declared bankruptcy. Uh, just think if you'd been the just think if you'd been in the in the oil business two years ago, you would have thought your job was really safe. Or better yet, oh, yeah. think, think if you worked for Enron in January of two thousand one. You were investing your all your retirement in Enron stock. You were a turkey because it came it came down fast and no one saw it. So the point here is you need to, all three of these, you need to be assessing frequently and saying, okay, and, and if, I, if I take care of my health and dress and skills through all of this, you will avoid ageism. Excellent. Well, that is what okay. we're looking to do. Um, and which kind of brings us to the next part, the, the very specific task of actually submitting applications for jobs um, I know we've touched on some things a little bit, you know, related to this, but I love, you know, any of your favorite tips on what people can do when they're submitting their job applications to, like you said, avoid ageism. Okay. Number one, in most cases, if the first time they are introduced to you is you applying online, most of the time, I don't care whether you're young or old, you're going to lose. This is where if you see a job posted, the first thing I want you to do is make a contact. Find someone inside who's willing to help you. That's why in my targeted job search strategy, we go out and target companies and build relationships at those companies. And, and again, one of the things I want to do is I want to target companies that will be fair hiring. And and just get really clear, this is one of the great things about LinkedIn, is I can go out and look at the employment base for a company and see if they have people who look, taste, and smell like me. 
I, and I probably want to steer my way towards those companies. Two, I probably, if I, when I submit, I don't want to put more than 10 to 20 years of experience on my resume. If you've got 40, don't put it on there because it probably isn't relevant. Anything in these days, anything over 10 years largely is irrelevant. But the key piece here is you want someone inside pulling for you. And the more you can do that, the better. And yeah, I, it's, it's, it's use, use your network. And, and the one of the things I talk about a lot is using your weak ties. Use, uh, the concept of a weak tie is someone who you know, who you probably don't, just not your best buddy, not real close, maybe somebody you worked with 10, 15, 20 years ago. And those people are more valuable to you than the people who know you really well. The reason why is they know people you don't know. And today, job getting a job is relationship based. You know, when we've gone to online portals uh, and pe submitting into ATSs, those things have become giant black holes work the relationship and that will steer you clear of most ageism if 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 the if the organization does not if the organization doesn't like hiring folks our age then the odds are you're not going to get hired so find the companies that are and build the relationships does that make sense Bree? yep i think so that is pretty clear so let's go on to our next topic which is click on over here. Um, for interviews and networking, which you're talking about really working your contacts, how can people get over through past ageism? So when you're okay. kind of face to face with somebody or voice to voice, what are you trying to do? Okay, particularly in networking, one of the things you're trying to do is be able to, to re relate to the other person. Now, uh, I find one of the, if I meet somebody young, the easiest way I can relate to them is they may they may have something in common with my son. Um, I'm looking for a connection point. And by the way, very often that connection point may not have anything to do with uh, with what, what what you do. So, for example, I live here in Austin, Texas. Uh, Bree's up in Dallas. She understands that Austin just is growing like crazy. When I moved here 38 years ago, there were a quarter million people. We're now at you know, 1.5 million. Um, no one's from here. So when I meet somebody in a networking event, my first question is, how'd you get to Austin? Everyone has a story, and every likes, everyone likes telling it. And what I'm trying to do is I want to keep asking questions until I find something we have in common. Now, what we may have in common may be something that's, that's related through my son, but that's fine. It's, it's trying to come up with that connection point and be relatable. And this, this is similarly in interviews. You want to find some way to connect. Connect on a personal level, i.e., you want to be likable. One of the key things is the people, people who are really good at asking questions are more likable. And the reason why is because you're taking an interest in them. And people will, if you are good at, at building that kind of relationship, I don't care how old you are, it works. Now, on the other side, you have to understand networking has changed. You need to get on social media. I can't tell you. I've, I've pitched at a number of different Rotary Clubs in the past, and they'll, they'll all tell me, these kids, they don't know how to, they don't know how to inter, interrelate. They're, they're not very social. And I go, oh, no, they're very social. They're just social in a different way than we are. 
And the reality is, if you want someone to listen to you, you need to adapt to them. I want you to think about that. If you want someone to listen to you, you have to adapt to them. They are not going to adapt to you. This is no different than in you know, 2000 to 2004. I spent a lot of time training engineers in mainland China or People's Republic of China. And I didn't suddenly think that I'm going to have to make, make them look like Westerners. I had to adapt to them to get them to understand the material I was presenting. So if you have, if you're talking to 20s and 30-somethings, yes, you need to adapt to their communication styles, which probably is electronic. It's it's kind of like I joke in my multi-generational workshop. Um, if you ever leave a voicemail for a 25-year-old guy, they won't listen to it. So don't do it. <laughs> Text them. And that's and, that's, and it's right. It, yes. <laughs> right. Uh, and by the way, they will respect you because you text you because you send them a text. If you know, if you're using, I'll use an example. I use Slack for to communicate with a number of my 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 partners, people I work with, um, and they can you know and. And they respect me because I'm the 60-plus-year-old guy who will use Slack. It's sort of almost as though you're it's sending that subtle signal that, uh, I don't know how to describe it, but it, it sends a subtle signal that just lets them know you're kind of on the same plane, you communicate in the same way. Um, yeah, that's very interesting. Now... <clears throat> I also say if you are managing kids, and these are kids, um, they are, uh, I, I claim anyone who's, I'm old enough to be their father as a kid, uh, is um, you need to teach them if they have a baby boomer boss, they need to learn to go talk to the boss. We like to be talked to. So it's a two-way street. But from your perspective is you're not going to get them to adapt to you. You're going to have to adapt to them. And whether that's being on social media, whether I, I mean, I, I'm a big proponent of Twitter. And when I go in and talk at my job club, the number of folks who are on Twitter, uh, I'll use the example. If I want to get a recruiter to respond to me, I tweet to them. Because usually it's going to show up on their phone. You know, if they accept if if they accept my if I if they accept my invitation to connect, I send them a tweet saying thanks for for accepting my invitation to connect. Can we talk? That gets through them real fast. <laughs> and so uh, it's learning these new mediums of communication and and using them. And just by just by being be able to use it, and use it in a fashion that they are comfortable with, they won't think of you as being old, because you're not. All right. Well, I think that's uh, very helpful. And so, kind of along the same lines, our next um, topic here is about personal branding. So, in terms of personal branding, what steps can can people take now to kind of fight against ageism? Sure. The first one is get a good picture. And more importantly, I want a good background. <clears throat> um, in fact, I just talked at my job club and we had a job fair and I was doing uh, LinkedIn reviews and I had one guy, he was, he was an engineer, he was a nerd. He had a picture of him standing outside. I said, no, I want you standing in front of a whiteboard. Uh, with technical stuff behind you or in the lab. Um, I want you, uh, in other words, I want you to immediately give them the impression that you're right on it. You're technically up to date. You are, you're at the top of your game. Okay? So just simply having a nice picture with a black background or, you know, 
something. Um, no, I want you to. I want you to demonstrate. Give that impression that you are right on, on top of it. I want you use the language that is current and up to date in your industry. I want you again. I I, I want you out there promoting yourself. So the key piece here is how do I, I want you to take a step back and say what do we I ugh, what do I want to be known for? And this is this is the time where very often it's good to sit down with other people and say, okay, what am I good at, and what what exactly am I known for, and then how do I promote that? And so, and I said the biggest one I always do when I do LinkedIn profile reviews. The first thing I do is I look at the picture, and my first comment always is, "What does the picture? What are you trying to say with the picture?" You know, it's rather than say, "Well, it's a picture." No, what's the message you're trying to deliver? And you actually have to t take that and and really focus on on thinking about what is my personal brand and I <clears throat> I like the definition of personal brand is Jeff Bezos is from Amazon is your personal brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room so what do they say about you and so this is going out and talking to people one of my favorite exercises I use with clients is say go to go talk to three people three people who know you from work and three people who know you from your personal life and go Hey, um, can you give me three to five phrases that describe me? And those two groups may very well give you either completely different answers or slightly different answers. So, uh, and by the way, we all have slightly different personas at work than we do in our personal life. I just want you to know that. But take that and use the vocabulary that they use to describe you. Because very likely it's very accurate as to who you are. So that's hopefully I've given you some stuff to really think about, things that you can do almost immediately. Yep, I think so. I, I've even got a couple on my list. <laughs> Thank <Okay>. you for those. <laughs> um, and this is perfect timing because we have some really good questions that we can get to here. So. Okay. Um, one of the first ones, and you touched on this briefly um, in talking about how Austin, where you live, is a city of, of a lot of people who are not from there. They're all new people coming to the city. And so one of our audience members here wants to know, how do you create a new network of contacts in a new city or location? Um, and I think that might also be kind of a similar to another question we received, which is how do you create a new network of contacts when you're changing careers at this point in your life? Yep. It's it, in both cases. It's getting very, very strategic. So, if if you need to build a new network, if if you know the industry you want to get employed in, is start looking for getting on LinkedIn, and one of the easiest is search at the companies where you think you might want to go, and start um, you know plug in the job title and your location and see where these people are working and that's when you reach out and connect and say oh by the way this is where you I, I claim this is where you go ask for air and air stands for you are asking for advice insights and recommendations now when you ask for advice people will rarely turn you down it's a compliment and by the way if they turn you down they're jerks and you don't want to talk to them anyway <laughs> uh, you know. and so the concept here is <clears throat> is go out and ask for the advice you know how, how is it to work there do you like working there uh, what advice do you have for me about, about getting a job there what are their insights and the last thing is always ask for the recommendations what should I do next can you introduce me to somebody um, and just keep working the personal contact contacts look for introductions and do it very very strategically so I use the example I did um, I've got a blog post if you search on career pivot for smart grid you'll find the um, you'll find the blog post 
of um, a gentleman named Daniel uh, here in Austin. He's now in, he he wanted to get into the smart grid industry. So what he did was he strategically moved to a couple different jobs. He had uh, he was working for Volusion. He wanted SaaS experience software as a service. So he'd gone there and and he said he he started a blog called the Technical Product Management Blog, and he started interviewing people in the smart grid industry once a month, and he produced a um, uh, this blog, and after about eighteen months, he had street cred in his new industry. People were willing to talk to him. Now, did he know that much more? No, he knew some more. But he knew a lot of people, and people wanted to talk to him now. So it was a, um, you know, it's 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 being very strategic and it's identifying the people, and it may not always be identifying the people who um, who are going to get you a job. It's getting the people who will make the referral for you. Mm -hmm. So one of my classic weak ties when I wanted to get a teaching job. One of my best connectors was my chiropractor. My chiropractor knew lots of people. In fact, she knew two superintendents of two different school districts. So um, it's very often it's um, these are are the people that you don't necessarily think about. I always claim one of one of the good ones for if you're a woman is maybe your hairdresser. They know lots mm -hmm. of people. people. People who know lots of people. You're right. They're right. sort of connectors. I think that was in maybe Malcolm Gladwell's book yep. about connectors, yep. people who know lots of people yep. and, and, like, and to, like to make those relationships. They like putting people together who need each other's help. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I, uh, I had the same woman cut my hair for about 35 years, and she, Darlene, finally retired. And now I'm going over to Bird's Barbershop here in Austin, and uh, and a Stephanie, who's 23, is cutting my hair now. And I, by the way, I don't have a lot of hair left, and and I've told her she's supposed to grow old with me. <laughs> Very nice. I, you know, I've, I've had one person cut my hair for so many years. I and I used to joke about Dar <laughs> I used to joke with Darlene that she should uh, charge me less each time I came in because I had less hair to cut. <laughs> So any right, other questions? Actually sort of, yes, um, kind of speaking on the flip side, so people who have got their look down, they're highly visible on social media, they are doing sort of all the right things in terms of how they're putting themselves out there, the experience they have, their credentials, and just kind of their attitude, their dress, that sort of thing. Um, one person specifically, and I think this is echoed in a number of people's questions, it, they're asking about... Um, how they can convince employers that they wouldn't be insubordinate or overqualified, that they're not going to be sort of that, that um, you know, person who thinks they're overqualified, I guess is the perfect word for it, that, that they fit into the company's culture. Yep. Um, so how do you get there? Okay. Number one, um, I, I've had several clients, clients who don't know how to close. You know, they have, have a conversation and, and, and they keep on waiting for the other side to offer something. So, in fact, I've got three clients right now dating to get a job. And what they've done is, when there was hesitancy, going, okay, uh, how, about, how about I come in for three months and uh, I'll come in as a contractor. I'll come in as a consultant. Uh, here's the job I'll do for you and for how many hours and for how long. Think about that. I will, and rather than saying, I want the job, can I come in and help you? And what happens is each time uh, they can, the, the employer can put a box around uh, the amount of money they're going to spend, what they're going to get out of it. And I like it saying, you're dating. Now, it comes both ways. In fact, I've got one client right now who got let go uh, by her previous employer. She's being hired. She's an accountant-type accountant, accountant type bookkeeper or accounts payable kind of person. And she's being hired by one of her suppliers, and she's going, I like to say, she's playing hard to get. She's saying, I'm going to come in for three months. I'm going to work to the end of, year, end of the year for you. Then we'll talk. And the employer really wants her. 
And she's going, no, let's wait until the end of the year. <laughs> I'll come in. I'll keep on working for you. And and so think of th think of this around the dating and marriage concept. And and but the key piece is if they're hesitating, make an offer. A couple of years ago, I had a client who um, went in and interviewed for a job, and they hemmed and hawed. And he said uh, he already had a another part time contracting gig going on with his previous employer and he says you know I got 20 hours a week can I come in for 20 hours a week good rate I think we charge hundred dollars an hour but let me come in and he had pitched a, in, an, in the interview a four-step plan he said let me come in for three months and do the first two steps I'll come in for 20 hours a week you know what they bid on it now if he hadn't proposed that by the way it would have never happened. So you got to get you got to get creative, if that makes sense. It's it's go in a sales perspective. You need to close. You need you need to go make the ask, and and the ask very often is not for the job. It's a chance to it's a chance to show your stuff. All right, thank you. Um, so I think we have time for a few more questions here. Um, I think this came up, it, it reminds me of a question that we might have asked you in a previous webinar, but for women in particular, there always seems to be the added emphasis on looks, um, and for better or worse, usually worse, that's just the way it seems to be, um, that women have you know more to kind of deal with in these areas. I actually just this week read about a software program for people doing video interviews that automatically puts a filter if you're in they they build it to women I suppose men could use it too but a filter to make it look like you're wearing makeup on your video like Skype interview um, yeah. so that you don't have to do that sort of thing like wow gal thanks um, <laughs> so, uh, so anyway somebody's asking uh, is dyeing your hair something that if you are going gray or you're already gray um, something that you recommend doing um, to, as part of the overall look that you're going for I, I guess a lot of it depends on where you're trying to get hired. I'd rather you find companies where that are fair hiring than trying to make yourself fit. Um, it's it's a double-edged sword. Um, as I said, this is where I come look for companies that hire people that look, taste, and smell like you. And and. You know, should you go dye your hair? Uh, put it this way: it it doesn't hurt to um, uh, to make yourself look younger. Whether you're a guy, and you know, as you can see from the picture, I'm I don't have a whole lot of hair on the top of my head anymore. Um, to uh, you know, just making yourself more attractive. Now, by the way. Women are, are, are far worse than guys. You are, more, you are more critical of your own looks than anybody else will be. And so actually get some feedback. You know, this is a public, I always joke, as a public speaker, uh, I'll see videos shot of me, and everyone says, wow, you're great. And I look at it and go, oh, God, I did this, I did that. You know, you will be more critical of yourself than anybody else will be. And so um, the answer is, do you want to go get your hair dyed? The answer is maybe. So it sounds sort of like do do what you're comfortable with in terms of your looks and that sort yes. of thing. If that's something yes. that you would feel, if it's going to make you feel strange and like you're not yourself, then don't do it and look more for employers where you really fit. So this might actually kind of come into another question that we have here about um, dress. You were talking about, uh, kind of matching the look of what you know, whatever company that you're going for, within reason, of course, what what you're comfortable with, not to like mask yourself, but to just update yourself. Um, somebody's asking, how do you actually find out what the dress code or what people are wearing at a certain company is? How uh, do you get that kind of insider information before you get to the interview? Well, number one, ask if you're dealing with a recruiter. Ask, uh, I, you know, how should I dress? Two, show up the day before and just walk watch people coming in and out of the building um, do you do your investigation uh, showing up the day before is a really good way I mean I'm a 
I've traveled all over the world and I love to people watch. Um, and it's, it's go watch the people and see how are they dressing, how are they carrying themselves. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of like I, I always uh, tell people when they go to a new culture, the first thing you should do when you land in a new city that's a different culture is go, go stand around a, a grocery store and watch. How do they carry food in? How do they pay for it? Uh, how do they, you know, what's the packaging? Similar, similar here. Go, you know, take an hour or two and, and, and wander around and see how do they look? Do they take breaks? You know, walk up to their office. Um, it's actually easier than, than you think. And I will throw in some advice for anybody who's looking for jobs in another city where you can't quite get there. Um, you know, uh, Glassdoor.com is a good resource for finding insider information into companies. Um, and you can also use sites like Quora.com, Q-U-O-R-A.com, which is just sort of a mass question and answer site on any question you could possibly imagine. So you can post a question about dress codes at a particular company and see if anybody responds or search for that information to see if anybody else has ever asked it with responses coming in. Um, so that's another way is just to kind of, and even just a simple Google search might reveal some of the websites where people are talking about that too. So you might be able to gain some insider info um, that way if you can't physically get to the location. I've been helping somebody with a, a lo very long distance job search. <laughs> so we've been talking about ways to get this information without, um, without uh, having to actually travel there beforehand. Um, yeah, and what yeah. you said, I wish I had that advice. I went to Ireland about 10 years ago before plastic bags were being banned here in grocery stores. And I went to an Irish grocery store, loaded up my cart, got to the checkout and realized, oh, they don't, they don't have bags. I don't have anything to carry any of this. <laughs> I should have sat down and watched everyone before I actually went in and did it myself. So good well, idea. Right. You, you, you learn a lot about a culture just by looking. It's kind of like I used to go to China, and you quickly look around, and Chinese don't buy dead fish. Fish are always alive when you buy them, so they have them in tanks. You see that in Chinatown. Or, or just looking at packaging and how they pay, and it, it tells you so much about the culture. Mm -hmm. Similar here. Very true. You, you, you want to you, you see. And by the way, a, another good resource is a company's Instagram account. Oh, good one. Yeah, Instagram, Pinterest, any of those would give you yep. uh, some extra yeah. insight there. And you may very well see people at uh, company events, um, you know, when someone's presenting, um, you know, at a company event, and you, you'll see how people are dressed. Awesome. Well, this is great. I think that's a great place to end because it's kind of fresh in people's minds to use those resources wisely. Um, and we're at the top of the hour. So thank you, Mark, so much for all the awesome information here. Um, it's always a pleasure to have you. Well, thank you, Bree. And thank you for Jennifer handling this stuff in the back end. All right. And so you can learn more from Mark Miller. Uh, he's got a couple books out, both Repurpose Your Career, which I think is in its second printing or second edition. Is that right? Well, well, we're going to come up with a second, second edition uh, early next year. I've got preview, uh, preview chapters right now. It's the little link on the page, careerpivot.com slash flexjobs. That will take you to a link where you can register and get... Uh, I think I've got four preview copy, uh, preview chapters out there. I'll be coming out with another one here shortly. Um, and 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 by the way, at the same time, check out my podcast. Yes, indeed. Um, and so, and Mark set up this nice landing page for anybody here. If you go to careerpivot.com/flexjobs, you can get more information on that. So be sure to visit that. And then also just some information for our audience on next steps from this webinar. So we will be emailing you all tomorrow with a link to this recording so that you can replay the full webinar as you'd like. And it will also include a very brief survey. It's only two questions just about your experience with this webinar and feedback that you have. Um, and then a handout. Uh, it's the handout that you have access to today, but we'll also send you a copy tomorrow just in case you didn't get that um, from the GoToWebinar control panel today. We are also hosting two more webinars uh, in December. December 6th is with American Red Cross, ADP, and Broadpath Healthcare. They're all currently hiring for flexible jobs, so you'll be able to hear from recruiters at each of those companies. And then on December 13th, 
we have a, a single employer webinar with a company called Appin to learn about their flexible remote work opportunities. So uh, for both of those, you can do the same sort of Q&A with their recruiters that we did today and uh, learn very specific information about their companies and their job openings and how to apply. Uh, and as always, uh, oh, you can go for all of our full webinar listings. You can go to flexjobs.com blog and then go under Flex Jobs Resources and Job Search Webinars and Videos. We'll give you the full listing of what we've got coming up. Well, Mark, thank you so much um, for the great information once again, and happy autumn. Happy almost Thanksgiving. Yeah, thank you very much. I hope, I hope you have a really happy Thanksgiving. Yes, and hopefully none of us will be turkeys in the near future. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot, everyone. Best of luck in your searches, and have a great day.